This is Duke University. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon. This is a Karsh conversation on the job search and what's different for international students. Um, my name is Hal Matthews, and I'm an Associate Director for Global Careers with the Duke Career Center. Um, I'd also like to shout out my colleague, Elizabeth Moore, who is with the Duke International Student Center, who helped coordinate and promote this conversation today. Um, I'm really excited about this because this talk features three incredible international Duke alumni who have recently completed their degree programs and launched successful careers in the United States. Um, as many of you, if not all of you know, the path to employment in the USA for international students isn't always an easy one. So from figuring out what to major in, to navigating CPT and OPT regulations, to answering the dreaded, will you now or in the future require sponsorship to work in the US question, uh, this job search is, is certainly different for international students. Um, luckily, these alumni have just navigated this process successfully, and they're really excited to share their insights with you. So Yining Liu graduated from Duke in 2022 with a PhD in biomedical engineering. Um, she holds a bachelor's degree in pharmaceutical sciences from Peking University and a master's degree in bioengineering and biomedical engineering from UCLA. And during her time at Duke, she participated in the Duke Advanced Professional Degree Consulting Club and Duke Interdisciplinary Social Innovators. Yining currently works as an associate with a top three consulting firm. Manmeet Singh uh, graduated from 2020, graduated in 22 from Duke with a BS in computer science. And during his time at Duke, he participated in several different industry internships, was a Bass Connections fellow and served as president of the Duke Blockchain Lab. And after completing his degree, he worked as a software engineer with DMA Labs and currently works as a developer advocacy consultant with Deal. And Yashin Liu graduated from Duke in 2023, this year with an MS in economics and computation. She works as a data analyst in supply chain, marketing, and finance, and is currently a financial analyst with Miller's Ale House. So I cannot thank the three of you enough for being here today. I know some of you are working from different time zones, and you're currently in the middle of your workday. So really appreciate you taking the time. Um, before getting into it, I wanted to give just a brief overview of the plan for today. So um, I've got some questions prepared for the panelists, but we'd love to hear your questions as well. So feel free to drop any questions you have in the chat as we move through the conversation, if you think they'll be relevant for the broader group. And we'll have a few minutes at the end for a QA. and um, I also know that Zoom events aren't always the best way to connect on a more personal level. Uh, and I want everyone to have the opportunity to have some smaller conversations with our panelists. So after we finish the main conversation, I'm going to open up breakout rooms for a couple of minutes so you have the chance to meet with each of them in a more personal setting if you'd like to. Um, I'll give some more info on that later on, but just wanted to give a heads up about that now. Um, so turning to our panelists, uh, again, thank you for being here. Could you each of you like briefly tell us a little bit more about yourselves, including your background, um, home country, what you majored in at Duke, and maybe a little bit about the industry that you currently work in. And uh, I'll hand this one off to Yining if you want to start. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Yining. I am a currently a associate um, at McKinsey out of Atlanta office. Um, and before that, I graduated last year in August um, in biomedical engineering. And my previous life, um, I did tissue engineering and create potentially, you know, solutions for chronic wound healings. Um, but right now I work as a management consultant and I am still doing a little bit of random walk and happy to talk about that a little more. But my experience has been focused in consumers um, and in chemicals. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, Yashin, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. I am Yashin. I study economics and computer science at Duke and also in my undergrad. 
And during my master's and my undergrad, I did a bunch of research before instead of a lot of internship. So I was kind of throwing into the real world to find a job. And right now I'm working as a data analyst in multiple teams, which I like a lot because the job that I'm currently working in requires a lot of interpersonal communication, which I really like. A lot of times I have to set up conversation with different teams and fig dive into the things to figure out how to connect different information from the different departments. So um, I like that a lot. That's that's my introduction. Thank you, thank you. Manmi? Yeah, for sure. Firstly, uh, it's very nice to see some familiar faces here now that I'm going through the guest list. Uh, <laughs> they're smiling back. Uh, so yeah, I graduated spring of 22. Uh, initially, I was uh, an ECE and CS student, um, but pivoted away from ECE senior spring uh, for some reasons. And then I think those might be pertinent to some of you coming up in the job search questions. Um, so graduated CS, I think the most defining uh, and certainly the most rewarding experience that I had at Duke was being able to work as a research uh, assistant and a TA at the Fuqua School of Business. Uh, did that for three years, uh, helped teach two courses on blockchain technology. Um, got out of college, started working as a software engineer for a five person startup. And now I am consulting a blockchain foundation, uh, helping them grow their business footprint in the U.S. Um, so, yeah, yeah, happy to answer any questions around, uh, well, first of all, finding a job in this market and then also working remotely slash working across time zones, working in uh, new tech. Though I'm, I, I assume Yining and Yashin are also quite familiar with that. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, happy to, happy to get the conversation started. Awesome. Thank you. So clearly we have a lot of different representation across industries, but also types of degree and degree levels. So thanks again for being here. Um, I would love to know what motivated each of you to pursue employment in the U.S. So did you consider working uh, in any other countries in addition to the U.S. or did you focus solely on the U.S. and, and why? Whoever would like to go first, maybe Yashin? Yes. So I was only looking for the jobs in the U.S. because mostly because the past experience from my master's degree, I met a lot of great people and I really like how the society and the culture here where I can meet a lot of diverse diversity. Um, so I really want to stay here for a longer time to observe and understand how the society work. That's one of the main reasons. And also... I feel like compared to most of my past experience of internship in China, the company culture here is much more friendly to young people. They are respectful and helpful to support younger people and also women in the career. Awesome, appreciate it. Yeah, it's. I think many of us are excited about the prospect of, of working in, in different places. And I know the prospects can look different depending on what country you're searching in. Uh, yeah, Yining? Yeah, I, I was going to say that I totally echo what Yashin was sharing about how the work culture and the support level for, you know, different diversity, women and all, it's like just, I, I want to say better. I just, I prefer it here. Um, that said, I also um, have tried doing my ser job search in China as well. I think um, it's, definitely different and you you could see from the interview process that um, the empathy is different when I am doing the, my job search over there. So I think um, I compare both process and my experience and I end up deciding that I prefer working here for now um, for a little longer. Mm -hmm. Great. Manmeet, how about you? Uh, yeah, I definitely resonate with the, the points on, on culture I think if you're if you're younger have less life experience but you have ideas uh, people in America might be a little more uh, you know we're, we're culture is a little less strictly hierarchical so that's a nice thing uh, but I guess my decision was mostly informed by the fact that I'm working in deep tech and 
research and I'm interested in going back to school and in the for in going back to school and in the foreseeable you know, work in that that sort of very fast paced entrepreneurial uh, deep tech environment. And I think the U.S. is definitively the place to be uh, uh, if if you're interested in stuff like that. So if each of you could share a little bit about how you approached your job search in the U.S., I'm sure everyone would hear, would love to know more about that. What job search strategies did you use to find opportunities and, and what were the most effective? I actually, I, I could start there and just throw to my two cents. Um, I wouldn't say I have a strategy per se, but I do have like a timeline in a way because I was in a PhD program for six years. So I sort of started my exploration around like my third or fourth years where I actively utilize a lot of school, like this um, resource on campus, um, join, you know, consulting clubs and join the DC clubs um, just to do some projects on campus and utilize a lot of um, do career centers um, as help to like explore some possibilities. Um, and in my fifth years, I did an internship um, with a private equity firm. And that's also during COVID as well. So it was a remote internship and it helped me prepare for my job search. Um, and in my fifth to six years, I started applying. So actively participating in a lot of like um, consulting case um, competitions and a lot of the case interview events and like there's a lot of recruiting events from the consulting firms as well um, plus a little bit of networking um, so that kind of like lent to later um, interview and getting my job and and I'm curious Yining, because you were obviously completing a PhD at the same time um, how did you find balance there to you know pursue these Kind of professional development opportunities and, and internships while you were doing that PhD work at the same time. Right. Yeah, it's definitely challenging. And I think I was lucky, lucky in that COVID happened and I was like stuck at home for a chunk of time and I work in wet lab. So I just um, I work not, in wet lab. So I just I hear an echo, sorry. Um, so I just cannot um, go into lab to work. So I get to have some time to do my remote internship. And I also, um, probably because my advisor is more supportive. So we kind of like coordinate. So she knows what I'll be focusing on in lab. And I have some other time dedicated to um, my research on the side. Sounds like it takes a lot of planning either way. Totally, yes. And communication and be transparent. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about you, Manmeet? Any any strategies that you you know employed for your job search that worked well? Yeah, um, hold on. My mother's calling me. Let me just give it to me. just come that's important. Back. You can take it. You know, just join that's back fine. in like ten minutes or so. It's totally fine. Um, it's like I got all these apps on my phone for efficiency, but sometimes it gets in the way of work. Um, uh, but yeah, I I'm a fat. So first of all, I tried many strategies. Uh, and ninety nine percent of them failed miserably, and I think that's part of the process, and also why I wanted to come and talk because I really believe that you know if I've noticed that something doesn't work, I should just sort of pass it on. Um, that's part of the process. Uh, I you know when I was at at Fuqua, I noticed something that they do at Fuqua that they don't do elsewhere at Duke, which is a big problem in my opinion which is that they give the FUQA students a dedicated, I don't want to say education, but they definitely train them on how to find a job, right? And there's a course that they have to take as a prerequisite for graduating from the MBA uh, that where they just learn how to find a job. And I think today you're looking for jobs through the internet. That's number one. Secondly, you're looking for jobs through the internet during a time of soft economic crisis, moving into hard economic crisis, question mark, exclamation point. So having that sort of you know framework and those skills is very, very important. So I would just recommend everyone in this room to quickly search up this book called the 2R Job Search. Um, it's a summary of the course that they teach at Fuqua uh, now, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not a, 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 a trying to sell the book or anything, but 
I think it's a must have, and it's even more a must have for Duke students, seeing as this this knowledge came out of Duke. Right? Yep. Is that is that what it is? That links to a recording of of one of Steve Dalton's talks on the two hour job. Awesome, awesome. So Steve Dalton taught at Duke. I believe he left last year. Uh, too bad. Uh, but yeah, so so that's that's one thing that I would recommend people go through. One thing that I would recommend people go through. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah, very practical steps if you're trying to maximize your times and time and come up with a clear process of how do I actually do this? How do I organize this? How do I keep it manageable? Um, it's a really great, great process for that that resonates with a lot of students. Um, Yashin, any any thoughts from your perspective? I totally agree with him regarding the point of have a framework of how to find a job or the timeline of how how do I approach this problem. So before I start to work with Career Center, I feel like a lot of things are very confusing for me because I'm the type of person who get used to have some basic knowledge or understanding of something, understand the approximate approach to do it before I start to do it. But finding a job in another country is a very different thing and hard to do because all the culture, especially the culture in professional setting are very different from what we get used to and maybe they are something that's totally normal in your own country but it's different here and you can't do it or you in the other way you're encouraged to do it but you don't know so I feel like working with the people in the career center is a very helpful way for us to understand the overall um the overall idea of how to start or prepare ourselves and also a good resource to ask even dumb question when you sometimes I will ask people saying this is my understanding but I don't actually have common sense in this field could you tell me whether it is correct for me or appropriate for me to say this or do this so that's a very effective way I love that. Um, and there's no such thing as, you know, dumb questions in this space. We all have different experiences and different exposure. We're all coming from different backgrounds. So definitely selfishly want a plus one, you know, engaging with the Career Center and, and connecting with, with us as well. Um, so I've heard about the two hour job search. I've heard about the Career Center. Were there any other resources or networks that played a crucial role in your job search process or really helped you along the way? Anyone who wants to take this one? I think, and, and this is coming more so from the perspective of working in startups, uh, which I'm sure is very, very different from working at McKinsey. Uh, but it helps to have a network. And a lot of people are going to think, hey, I'm 20, I'm 21, I have no life experiences or work experiences to speak of. And that's correct, you don't. But at least, you know, when you're at Duke, you're part of this sort of special, uh, you know, community where even if you don't have all of that, people who do are willing to pull you up and help you. And I think being able to tap into that network is very important. I also think it's very important to tap into Duke's pockets once in a while. Because if you're looking for jobs, especially in startups, uh, you're going to want to travel to uh, different places, to uh, different places, talks, right? You want to go for, I, I have friends who recently got into very, very uh, good PhD programs and they would just go, fly down to New York, first chance they ever got uh, for, for research talks. And, and their academic clubs, their professors would finance a lot of that. Uh, and I think that's that's quite important um, from what you can take from Duke, per se. I think going to classes, you know, it's not going to help you at all because in my re opinion, retrospectively, you're going to get the same classes on YouTube, probably better ones. But but the network and the, the money is, is something that Duke will give you uniquely. Yeah, there's definitely a powerful network here. Yeah. Yeah, totally echoed Mama's point on like network. And I think Duke alumni is like a huge circle. Um, even just like through our own like alum network, I think we have a website of that or just on linking, like searching and reaching out to people. Um, 
I was going to say along that line as PhD, at least for um, BME, we have a organization called PhD Plus, which is kind of like a network for people that goes to industry and work and come back and like, you know, network with people that still pursuing their PhD degrees. Um, so that's like an extension of like the alumni network. And I leveraged that a lot when I was thinking about doing an industry career before. And I spoke to a lot of alumni in that way. And the other is more perhaps consulting, like specifically, like we have a consulting club and we have DC, I think that's Duke Interdiscipline Social Innovators, which is um, like a organization who does pro bono consulting project. So those two organizations help um, for me on my way of experiencing consulting. And they offer like projects to do. They offer um, a small network for people that you could connect with. Um, because I think the other side of the alumni network is your peer who is actually like doing the same job search as you do. Um, and they offer you a lot of support. They could be your bouncing board and your thought partner. And in the future, they'll be um, your network too at work. So like right now, a lot of my old case partner becomes my friends and colleague uh, in my company or outside. Um, so that's also just another part of the network that you can leverage on. Yeah, just having thought partners and people who are going through the same things, you can make such a difference, right? Exactly. Especially when you like bomb an interview and <laughs> you need to talk <laughs> to someone or cry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yashin, anything else? Um, no. Great. So I want to ask, you know, we talked a little bit broadly about job search strategy approaches. What were the biggest challenges that you faced when job searching specifically? Is there anything that sticks out into your mind that was a really big struggle or barrier for you? And how did you overcome that challenge or those challenges? I, I can go uh, first, I suppose, and it's, it's a, related to the last point uh, about networking. You know, sp specific, this, this is specific to the culture that I come from. I don't know if it's replicable uh, across, uh, across different countries or cultures, but at least where I'm from, you know, we were always taught to ace our tests, do well in competitions, and, and that was the extent to which you were really supposed to put yourself out there. You know, like you're very, you, you know, you were supposed to be a bit more formal with people who are elder to you or people who are maybe one or two ranks above yours. Um, and I think when I came to college, uh, my biggest failing, because I think all of your challenges first start with how you think. We start thinking differently, you start figuring out your challenges. Uh, the, the biggest challenge was that I just didn't know how to connect with people. You know, uh, and, and that means, you know, cold, you know, connecting with someone on LinkedIn is amazing, but the way like how you reached out to me on LinkedIn, you you actually had something to say, you created common ground. You were like, hey, I'm from Duke, you studied at Duke, you're like you are trying to help some students. So so those those soft skills around around being able to connect with people uh uh are, are very, very important. You know, one thing that I hesitated to do was just ask for help because uh, uh, you know, you just don't do that where I'm from, but, but I found that you can talk to a 55 year old CEO of a very, very successful company and just say, Hey, I studied here. I see you study here, your children go here and I love your work specifically this thing, which I think is very impactful. And I'd like to ask you a few questions or observe, or, you know, get lunch with you. And, and I think that's well within the lines of, of what you should be doing. So, so yeah. That's the biggest challenge in my life. Definitely. Yeah, I can totally echo with that. Um, and I think another part of that thought when I was trying to network is also that I feel like I have nothing to offer them and I'm just asking them for help and their time. Um, so, but I think as I progress, I realized that for one, there's always something you can offer, like even just a listening ears of, of what they're there to share, um, and act on their suggestion and all. And you can always pay forward by talking to some newcomers or your next generation. 
Um, so there's always like a, a cycle of giving back and also definitely don't feel bad of like reaching out, networking, learning from um, the seniors experience and then paying it forward. Re regarding the point that Ening made, I remember something from a lecture that I watched before that makes so much sense to me. It says that the possibility of when you're reaching out to people, whether that people is going to respond to you or help you or not, it doesn't depend on whether you reach out to them. It depending on whether that person is a help, a good person who are willing to help. So when you're reaching out, you're just increasing the possibility of being helped by reaching out to more people. And a lot of times they are not responding. They're not friendly or polite, but it's not over problem. It's they are not a helpful person. So in that way, I feel like um, as an international student, we might feel better or more, more comfortable to reaching out. Um, regarding the original question of what's the difficulty in finding a job, I feel that my challenge is I am a, I'm the type of person who really want to prepare well before I start to really doing it. So when I apply for the jobs at the beginning, I will spend so much time revising my resume and the personal statement according to each of the company and then want to make it perfect. But after a while, I realized that's so inefficient and not practical. And at some point, I find out Sometimes, especially in LinkedIn or any other website, because there are so many people out there to apply for the jobs, the HR is not looking for someone who is perfectly fitting this job or the best person to fit in. They just want to find someone who passed the bar. And then if they receive 50 resume that they think it's doable, um, they might just stop the process. So sometimes I revise my, my materials for days and then realize they are not hiring anymore. That's a very sad situation. So so I guess finding a job is very different from doing projects and a lot of school stuff where we want to be perfect on every step, but sometimes you just need to put it there for people to notice you. Another yeah. thing that I need to add, uh, I'm sorry, go right ahead. Uh, no, uh, please, please want to hear your perspective. Uh, I was just going to say that, that if you think that applying to uh, a, a job description on the internet and putting up your resume is going to get you a job, I promise you with overwhelming probability that you will not get that job, even if you're beyond qualified for it, uh, because it's not about the job and it certainly is not about you, but it's about the means of communication. Uh, you know, when someone puts up a website, and I, I invite you to do this, you know, within your own friend circle, just put make a Wix site or something. I think it's pretty simple, it's two clicks. Put up a question and then tell your friends to answer. Then you find that if it, become, if it becomes popular, you're going to lose track of who's reaching out to you because that's just how internet communities scale. Um, and so the best, and in my humble opinion, the only way to get a job is to get in through a personal connection. Uh, and so, yeah, I guess that kind of completes the circle on what we were talking about. Uh, and yeah, I, I mean, I used to feel really bad. I was like, I put in the work, I have a very high GPA and I got all these courses done and, and I got all these courses done and you know, this is a problem with the internet. You're fine. There's a little bit of an echo, but we can we can catch what you're saying, Manmi. Oh no, I meant I meant people not seeing your resume is is a problem with the internet. Uh, yes. With, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and and I I can't echo enough the importance of building meaningful relationships, and regardless of how you know impressive your achievements or. GPA or past experiences look on paper, it's going to be difficult to compete with a candidate who's already established a connection with someone at an organization who knows that they like them, they're comfortable with them, they like to work with them. That that can be extremely powerful. Um, I would love to shift just a little bit and, and talk in a little bit more detail about the visa piece, right? Because that is the essential difference when it comes to job searching and working in the U.S., so if you're comfortable sharing it, I don't want to pressure anyone. Would you mind telling us a little bit about your current visa situation? 
um, whoever would like to, to go first. Yeah, I'm happy to share. Um, so right now I'm on H1B visa. Um, and I started with OPP and I got the lottery um, pretty soon after I start. So H1B right now, I mean, I think a lot of the consulting firm um, sponsor H1B. So I haven't run into a lot of like visa issue just because I luckily got the lottery. So were, were you entered into the lottery during your first year of OPT? Yes, I actually, even before I started my job, um, they entered me for the lottery and I just quickly just got it that year. So I was really lucky on that. That's great. So, uh, and and this is a, a difficult question to ask, but, you know, looking, let's say five to six years in the future, are you are you already thinking at this point about, you know, what comes next? Yeah, I am thinking about like applying for green car and all that, just weighing my options right now. But also it's kind of far away. So I'm not sure if I, you know, my career would take what turn or where I would be in five years. It's so hard to plan that far in advance, right? <laughs> yeah. Yashin, Manit. Yeah, so, so currently I'm on F1 visa during my OPT. And my OPT have the extension, so extra two years, three years in total. I hope I could get H1B at some point. Have Have you been entered into the H1B lottery at this point? My company will sponsor it. For like net this coming March? Yeah. Okay, crossing fingers for you. Best Thank of you. luck. Yeah, Manmeet? Yeah, the exact same boat as Yashin, hoping to be in the same boat as Yinin. Uh, but um, I don't mean to be a depressing person, but I have found uh, that the H1B, at least now, uh, is it, 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 it sort of isn't even a meaning. You don't even get meaningful odds unless you have an advanced degree. Mm. Uh, just because of the sheer number of people uh, who are applying. Um, I, I hope things get better in the coming year when I'm applying and Yashin is applying, we'll find out. Um, another alternative uh, uh, that, that I think is worth thinking about, especially if you're interested in research or startups, especially startups, is the O-1 visa. Uh, uh, which which basically allows you to stay in the U.S. and work on your own project or do whatever you want for three extra years. So in a way, it's the same deal as OBT. Um, yeah, uh, another thing about, about visa. So currently I'm on, as I said, H1B, uh, uh, no, sorry, F1 OBT, STEM extension. But another thing for any of you who are interested in working in startups or smaller companies, is, and this is a controversial opinion, so uh, I guess uh, don't bite my face off, but I think the visa is not the most important thing. Okay, I think visa should not be your first, second, third, fourth, or fifth priority. If you're really, really passionately interested in startups or in doing some kind of research, uh, your first priority should be how skilled you are, how good your network is, and how much value you can provide, right? And if you can find that spot for yourself, uh, I think the visa thing works out. It, 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 it's really not worked out for people I know. Uh, and most of the people I know are also from the very, very competitive visa countries like India and China. So, so I would say that, you know, just focus on the work first and the visa kind of handles itself, uh, yeah. At least the OPT handles itself. You're entitled to it. And and adding on to that point, you know, I think that employers are, are looking to fill gaps, right, in in skills, talent, specific needs that they have. So if you're able to find that niche where you really excel and and you're really interested in and passionate about that, that can demonstrate a lot of value to uh, different organizations that might make them more willing as well to to go to bat for you and and support that that visa process. And, and just taking a step back for those of you who might have a little less information at this point about the H-1B visa, that is a very common employment visa that, um, that students generally try to apply for 
before or during their OPT uh, period at the end of their F-1 visa. And there's a limited number available every year. There's 85,000 total. It has to be sponsored by an employer. So you have to have you know, a job on OPT or a job offer. The employer has to enter you into that lottery. If you have a master's degree, you're entered into an initial drawing um, for the first uh, 20,000 uh, H-1B visas. If you don't have a master's degree, uh, or or master's or PhD, if you have a bachelor's degree, then you will be drawn in that remaining pool of 60,000. But if you're in the master's, you'll have that initial drawing for 20,000, and then you'll be re-entered if you don't win. So the odds can be a little bit higher. And the O-1 visa is the extraordinary ability visa, and that is a route that um, might have a slightly higher bar, but it gives you the opportunity to bypass that lottery for, for a visa, which is essentially luck-based at this point. Um, so, Manmi, you made an interesting point that not to think about the visa first, um, that it's not the end-all and be-all. But I'm curious, uh, because it can be so tricky to figure out which employers might be open to sponsorship, did, did any of you develop, you know, a strategy or a process for identifying employers whom you thought might be open to, to sponsoring you when you were searching? I suppose where your name works, like McKinsey, yes, they, they could hire the whole world at this point. Like you guys just keep going up and up and up. <laughs> I mean, knock on wood. Uh, for startups, I would say uh, there's no differentiation. That is, don't, don't even think about it because uh, the, the whole, you know, the, the, the delimiter there is a company is going to think, hey, I hired this person. I spend one good year or three good years training them, paying them, creating a dependence on them for my business. And then this person just disappears, right? Because they can't stay in the country anymore. Uh, here's the deal. The vast majority of new companies uh, don't even know themselves whether they're going to stay or disappear in the foreseeable you know, three-year period, most companies, if they're very good at what they do, run on, uh, on, on 18 months of runway, right? So, so you'll be, yeah, I, I, again, that's, that's what I know. I, I wouldn't want to comment on, on applying at a Google or a McKinsey or something, though I know that they just sponsor, but with startups, it shouldn't be your concern and you shouldn't self-limit because of, because of that. Yeah. yeah, Sheen, could you talk a little bit about your experience? Yeah, so when we are searching for a job, sometimes they will list it out whether they sponsor or not. Or when you talk to them, you can ask them directly, but probably need to be, I guess, polite because people always mention it's not polite to ask. I don't know why, but there is a website where if you enter the name of the company, you will be able to check whether this company have ever apply H1B for the people before. So that could be one of the um, data point that you can use, right? This, this website. So if that company never get anyone H1B, then it's possibly not going to do it. It's an indicator. Definitely. Yeah, it might not tell you what's happening in this current year, but it can be an indicator of whether or not they're they're more likely to do so. Right. Um, the but, nice thing. Yeah. Yeah. But I do heard some some of my friend mentioned to me that a lot of times some of the big companies, they will claim they don't sponsor people. And so she actually get into an internship. So um, the company and the position supposedly they won't sponsor people but because she performs so well so the manager talking to their boss and then get her the sponsor sponsorship so i believe a lot of things could be flexible and also considering the situation for international students to find a job it's so hard when i start to find a job i will accept any type of offer whether they sponsor or not i can rely on my opt for a while and then figure everything else out i will just tell them I'm I'm open to um if you don't sponsor me. That's great. It shows the power of building those relationships and showing what you can do and, and winning people over that way. Um I, I also wanted to ask whether any of you had to answer the question, will you now or in the future require sponsorship to work in the US? 
And if so, how did you deal with that? Because it's usually a yes or no question and there's not an opportunity to provide too much context. And how many of us really know what our plans are, you know, three plus years into the future? I guess that just means we should move to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. If you have questions about this, we do have some guidance as well on the Career Hub website where you can reach out to me and we can talk through it. Um, I would actually love to know the answer for this because I always thought this is just a question to ask whether you are an international student or not. Well, it essentially it, it is in a masked way. Um, and I think that there's a lot of exceptions, right? Some some students are searching for positions and they're thinking, well, I really only want to work for one year on OPT or two to three years on STEM OPT. I'm not, I, I don't want to stay in the US after that, or I want to do one year of OPT and go back to graduate school. And that's my plan. So I won't need sponsorship from the employer. I think that that might be an acceptable way, but in general, if you are an international student, employers are going to expect you to say yes, because they're thinking longer term. They're thinking about return offers, regardless of your plans and, and the permanence. They want to know, like, can we retain this employee, you know, longer term without sponsorship needs? So while it's ultimately a, a difficult question and an unfair question to ask in many cases, um, I generally advise to, to answer yes to that question. And if you decide to proceed by answering no, it's important to clarify really early on in the job. You know, in, if you get an interview in that first interview or even beforehand by reaching out to a recruiter or your contact at that company to talk about your specific situation and why you answered it that way. Um, so it's definitely a tricky one for everyone. And it's just a difficult question to answer in general. Yeah. So there's a question in the chat um, about, you know, internships and whether internships helped with your job search. So I know that several of you did have internship experiences. Would you like to talk about that and how it did or didn't prepare you? From my perspective, internship in the U.S. is very important. So from what I've heard, sometimes when you're looking for jobs, and then if you have internship in other country, the company in the U.S. might not um, might not value that that much because it's a different culture perspective. And then if you have an internship in the U.S., that shows some of your ability or they have it's more like they have a more solid background knowledge about you. They know you are capable to work in the U.S. Um, environment and. Um, so this is about putting that experience on your resume side. Another way to think about it is I feel like finding an internship is a preparation of formally finding a job. The process is exactly the same and you're suffering through the same, same struggle all the time. So that's definitely a good way to prepare you for that, um, let alone the other return offer opportunity. So. I, I think my internship was super helpful because I got my internship in one of the career cent, uh, career center event. It's a career fair of the local smaller company. My internship was in a nonprofit organization. And um, this is the other thing. I think the career fair is super helpful. Um, a lot of the interview that I got are actually from the career fair, although Normally, when you go there, it's very chaotic, and there are so many small companies. But actually, most of the companies showing up are are decent. So, getting into any of those will be a good result. When I reach out to to the um, company in the career fair, at the beginning, they're not hiring in the short time. So, I just get a contact from the lady, and I send her a very friendly email and saying, um, like, thank. Thank you for like talking and sharing the information with me and then following up a little bit. But afterward, after several months, I realized that company on their website, they're actually hiring. So I reached out to that lady again. And the, the problem is um, from my situation, my department told me 
told us the deadline of apply for the CPT in a very short notice. So I thought I have an one or two extra months, but I actually don't. So I got so panicking and I started to search all the websites that I visited before to see whether they, ha they have any openings. And I sent an email to that lady again. She's an actually an HR. And I say, my this is my situation. I have a really tight deadline and I'm very interested in this position. It's fitting my background. And because we have the previous conversation and we have talked a little bit before, the, at the second time when I reach out to her, it's more like a connection and a friend instead of someone that you totally don't know. So she personally reached out to the hiring manager for me and send my resume to her and we schedule the interview in less than a week and I get that and get that internship so this is another thing that I really want to mention about um, how to utilize the career fair and the importance of following up with people because when you are talking to 20 people in one day you won't remember who they are and then when you're sending out the message after the meeting you might think it just a kind word to sending and follow up with them but actually, after a few months, no one will remember who you are. Everything, every, um, all the things they can notice is what's the previous chatting history. And then if you show friends, you were friendly and you're polite and you are passionate about the company and the job, they will have a good impression on you. And all the following conversation will be only based on that previous talk. That previous talk. Great input, great advice. Glad to hear you were able to make the most of that career fair as well. How about you, Yining? Yeah, um, for me, I think I also was going to say that I got my internship off an email list from Career Center, I think. Um, and the funny thing is that I sat on that email for two or three weeks thinking that, oh, maybe I'm not qualified and I'm trying to polish my CV for that two weeks. And the deadline kind of passed, but I'm like, okay, crap, let me just send it out. So I sent it um, and I got connected with the founder of that private equity and he was really friendly. He said that, oh, our program already started, but we can still have a chat. So I scheduled that chat anyway, and we had a really great conversation. So he's like, okay, you know what? Just like join. This is just the first week we just kick off, but why don't you come along? Um, so that again, kind of like shows the F or it shows the efforts of like following up and, you know, being proactive in building that first interaction and conversation, but also don't sit on your CV and try to polish it for too long. Um, another story of that life. Um, but I was going to say that internships definitely really helpful to answer that question. Um, I think it really helps me for one, understand what type of like role or job I want to be or do. Um, when I was interning in the private equity firm, I get to be part of the you know, actual professional world and business world, um, learn a lot of like tactical skills, but also think about like, is this the type of role I want to do long term? And the answer was no, which is why I end up exploring a little more and try to go into consulting. Um, and I think just tactically speaking, having that internship on your resume for a PhD student shows a lot of initiation and like can definitely differentiate you from the others. And kind of like what Yashin was saying, how this shows that you're capable of working in the business world in um, the US context. Tons of great advice there. Uh, internships, a chance to prove yourself, a chance to figure out what you don't like as much as what you do like, and an opportunity to build those relationships and, and how important relationships are as, as a common thread to, to finding great opportunities. Um, okay, looking back on your experience leading up to your job search and during your job search in the U.S., is there anything that you would have done differently if you were starting over today? I think I will probably network a little more and just be more comfortable talking to people and doing a little bit more of self-promotion. Um, I am more of an introvert person and coming from an Asian culture, I think where 
not as good at promoting ourselves and talking about our achievement and all. And I think it's been really helpful just again, going back to Career Center and my advisor, Rachel, um, we actually dedicate sessions for me to like think about how I want to talk about myself, what is most important about me that I want to highlight, what's my value and all, and craft it in a one minute to three minutes like conversation um, so I could like fall back to and use that to like break the ice. Um, so I think... Um, good in leveraging that resource, but also good to like dedicate some time to figure this challenge out, I think. Yeah. And it's, I would, yeah. I, I would start to do the job searching way earlier than I than I was. And also the other thing, Ini mentioned about sitting there feel insecure and feel that I'm not capable of applying for this job. I got that all the time. And if I could do that again, I would pretending that I can do anything and I will apply for all type of different jobs instead of sitting there and doubting myself and then end up didn't apply for those. Great input all around. Um, I think this is a good place to stop the recorded portion of this conversation. So those of you watching this recording retroactively, thanks for being here. Take care. Um, I'm going to stop that now.